Facebook on my Facebook profile. I just want to give everyone a, a fair heads up about that. Assuming it works, we'll see if the platform works. Uh, but Pete, welcome. I, I appreciate you've been uh, busy in the world and uh, as we all have in different ways. Uh, how have you been? Uh, you moved to your new home and, and you're spending a lot of time up at Golden Lake. How's it been going in your world? Oh, are you there? Oh, you're muted. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it has been good. Um, it's been busy. I don't read lips yet, but yeah. It's been good. It's been really busy. Um, of course, you know, a lot of people have had mental health issues with um, the change in the world. So we've been extremely busy just trying to provide services in different groups and um, trying to help people not forget who they are in the moment of uh, fear that presents itself. Right. So let's, uh, so uh, again, you and I are friends. We talk offline, um, not as much as I'd like, but you know, life is, we're all busy doing our thing. As a mom, I got some news today that was very, very destabilizing to me. I think a lot of moms with my uh, point of view um, feel the same way. Not everyone, of course, I understand that. Um, and it makes you feel, I went to uh, La Grotte, which is a, a Catholic shrine here in Ottawa. Uh, I you know, lit the candles, said the rosary. I'm not even Catholic and I did it. Uh, called on the ancestors uh, and uh, said, okay, what is it? What is it that you want me to do about this? Because there is a calling and a lot of us, those who are awake and aware, no. Uh, those who are kind of waking up are starting to sense something. Um, what do you think, you know, we could be doing in the world? Uh, again, recognizing that on this panel, um, the people that have signed up don't all agree with what's right and what's wrong. And um, while you and I have a similar mindset about things, uh, not everyone in the world does. So how do we, you know, affect change, heart-centered, uh, and yet um, be at peace with others' opinions, uh, without sort of crossing the line about um, keeping it pro-choice and, and positive and uh, having everyone happy and healthy at the same time. I think we've definitely lost our way. There used to be a point where we could have a discussion, where we could talk about both sides of an issue and maybe agree to disagree, and it wouldn't end your friendships. It wouldn't end your family relationships or change the nature. But it just seems like that middle ground has been completely lost. Mm -hmm. to a large degree. It's now just a matter of I'm right, you're wrong, or we are right and you are wrong. Mm -hmm. And the reality is sometimes there's not enough information really to be able to make that determination. So when you're not coming at it, and we've also watched the slow strangulation of critical thinking for a long time, where everything gets distilled down to basically emotions. People play their emotion, they live their emotion, and they express their emotion. So their emotions become what is correct, not necessarily what's actually fact. So people don't critically think anymore. They're just presented information. They accept it to be. And a lot of times, you know, they've, they've been in conflict with the sources of those informations or the providers of those information for a long time. But now it's just a matter of, okay, this must be what it is. So we should accept it as complete truth, even though there's viewpoints that are obviously um, opposite that particular mainstream point of view even within mm -hmm. even within that uh, realm well what you and I have talked about and we'll just keep it generic um because it is a public platform is within our own community there is division so if if we collectively uh with similar training similar you know advocacies and activism cannot agree <laughs> on what's happening or what should happen or what shouldn't happen depending on your point of view um you can see that the the world at large could also be in conflict right like if we can't collaborate if we can't see each other's point of view and respect uh each other then you know how are people unawake let's call that word awake unawake um there are divisions in my groups there are divisions in your groups and um lines are being drawn and uh, you know, it's the circle, it's the spiral, it's, it, it is a line, but it's the spiral. And, you know, we're all here uh, trying to advocate for the same thing, a happy, healthy, productive society. So we acknowledge, Pete and I acknowledge that some of you don't agree um, with each other, with us, um, and that's okay, because really we're here to have a discussion about how you can be the change and how you can change the narrative and the story, whatever part of the story you don't like. So what's the first, so 
uh, first thing someone can do, Pete. So again, you and I talked about the piece of news I heard on the um, the radio today about children, and I nearly had a car accident. And I was like, I literally had to go into prayer. Uh, I'll be doing ceremony later myself. But um, what would you say, you know, when you get um, the, the, the wall shake, right? Like the, the, the castle walls are shaking uh, and the Huns and the hordes are outside. What, what can we do? I think the easiest thing that you can begin to do is every piece of information that you receive, whether or not you know it, is attempting to change you. So it's trying to push you from your center or wherever you are, and it's going to meet you where you are. So if you've got a lot of fear, it could make you more afraid. Mm -hmm. Depending what the information is, it can also make you less afraid. It can reassure you. Right. So it's just going to meet you where you are. So obviously, taking a look at your fears and realizing how rational they are and what are they based on, that comes back to critical thinking, is very, very key. So I think understanding that nothing has the power to change you unless you want to be changed. And if you're not able to harness that change or to have a say in that change, you're not going to be in a better place for it later on. Right. And so when you say uh, you had a, a really um, wonderful Instagram post, uh, in fact, that what, what prompted our discussion publicly today, um, you talked about the dreaming. Of course, we have the May new moon coming up May 11th. Um, most of your graduates should know what the dreaming is, but for those of you who aren't a graduate of Pete's programs, um, what what is the dreaming to you and how can the lay person do the dreaming? Okay. So everybody does a version of the dreaming, but for some people, their dreaming is a nightmare. The dreaming is any ceremony, you might say, whereby you are picturing or envisioning a future outcome. So if you're in a fear-based place, you're either going to look for things that will make you feel safe, which will not be free in the energetic exchange of the universe. Right. Or you can say, you know, I see us, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, that we're in a really good place as a, a planet, as a species. Are you saying that officially or are you, you, you giving an example? Are you, are you actually saying that? I'm giving an example. Okay. I'm just, I'm just, I'm hopeful. I'm like, oh, was that some, was that a nugget or no? Okay. Yeah. So, so you're visualizing that as a possible end game. Correct. So what people do now is that, as we said, the people are playing their emotions. When you're really afraid, you cannot be afraid in the absence of an outcome, which is really, really important. It's not really talked about. We assume that fear is just an emotion. It begins as an emotion, but all emotions are based in an outcome. This is going to happen. My worst case scenario is going to happen. It's going to come true. And at that point, literally, you are in the, you're in the jaws of the wolf, right around your throat. And... Mm -hmm. It's not a great place to negotiate from. So learning how to make friends with your wolves, you know, your emotions is really key. So not all of your worst case scenarios are going to come true. Mm -hmm. But for so many people, uh, what basically makes fear work so well is the belief that you are powerless, mm -hmm. that there's nothing that you can do. They were on this roller coaster that's gaining momentum and it's heading in a direction that people maybe don't think is good. The one thing I personally believe is I don't think we're going to be going back to a normal. Whatever normal was, I don't think that we're going to be going back to it. It's just a feeling that I have. It's not based on anything. But like I'm saying, is that we can maybe have better than normal too, though. Mm -hmm. Right. And again, it did. my messaging and your messaging has very been on point. I've been a little earlier at speaking about it um, for your reasons. I'm not saying bad or right or wrong. Uh, it is time though, for people to start doing something <laughs> like, it's not like the pacifist, like watching the players on the field. It's time to either get in the game or, you know, like you said, don't complain when we get an, a, a result we don't like. Um, so what can people do tangibly? The dreaming, um, would that be like, kind of like a focused prayer? I mean, I know what that is in terms of the ceremony of it. But keeping this a, a, an outside of the eight fire kind of discourse, um, you know, it's visualization through through focused thought, through breath. Um, how would you describe it? I would describe it as getting into a relaxed state. So maybe that's just closing your eyes, taking a few deep breaths, and really connecting with how would you like the world to be five years from now, 10 years from now? anything that we are particularly 
that we're trying to envision? And more importantly, how would you like it to be? You know, is our children playing outside? Are they socializing? Is our people being fed on the planet? You know, are we learning that we can coexist with each other, with the actual planet itself? So all of those things become because too often we have this thing inside of us where we can look at something and we generally get an idea of where it's going. And that becomes truth. So it could be an instinct or an intuition, but our ability to navigate is what consciousness is. Mm -hmm. We can say, yes, that is one potential outcome, but it is not the only one. Let's talk about outcomes. Uh, you've spoken about this. Um, Lori Ladd has spoken about this. Frank Nicola, uh, Dean Nicola, or is that how you say his name? Um, and a couple other people, like real public, uh, international public figures, saying um, it hasn't been decided yet. So, so while we see a trajectory that, you know, from personally sets me way off, um, we need the collective um, to participate in creating the new. Uh, would you agree with that? We're, are we in it? Are we, is it a fait accompli? Like what, what, how would you describe it? Nothing is complete. Nothing is ever decided and nothing ever goes smoothly. If we're gonna talk about sides for either side in their, mm -hmm. in yeah. their in their um, expressions. So there's a lot of things that go wrong. There's things that are not foreseen. There are things that are just unknowns and those unknowns tend to be our friends. Right. So one of the one of the points I think Frank maybe raised or Lori raised, which I you've mentioned this like many, many moons ago. Uh, remember the story you told about the Algonquin people? They stopped using their psychic gifts because they're so psychic, 90%, you know, accurate, that they saw the crops being um, plenty. And so they didn't actually plant the seeds for that particular crop or season, and they almost died because what they saw didn't come true because they weren't in action. Um, can you speak to that kind of analogy today in our modern times where I, I see a lot of spiritual people who are deeply, you know, faith-based, uh, whatever their philosophy is, which I'm all for, but it takes each person doing something, right? Like it, it's, there are no others. We're the others. Like we're, we're, we're it. No yeah. one's coming to save us <laughs> as your, your famous tagline is. Absolutely. And I think, you know, with a lot of people is that I'm not saying exclusively, but spiritual people can, can be guilty from time to time of not taking action. Mm -hmm. They just spend time doing whatever they do, like whatever their form of uh, healing or meditating is. And they believe that it, that's the only practice. So like any practice, it has to go, as we would say in meditation, your meditation practice has to leave the cushion with you. And it has to come into your life. Your life has to become the ceremony. So in the absence of action, a lot of things just unfold the way something else is deciding because you're not having a say in it. Mm -hmm. so you can't vacate you can't do any form of healing and then when things get bad decide that you're gonna take a sabbatical or a vacation or that it's too rough i mean that's I, yeah i that's, keep hearing this line someone's gonna do something and i keep hearing it over and over again well don't worry someone's gonna do something i'm like well you're someone i'm one you're one like what are you doing about it well, this and is and it's, it's that, no offense, it's the bullshit, uh, it's the bullshit of it. And you and I have been in the trenches a very long time. We're used to it. We've been affected financially, emotionally, spiritually, uh, family-wise, and different for different other reasons pre, pre this event. So we're used to it. And we're like, you guys are, you know, cushioned and safe and protected, and you're not getting that it's going to affect everybody at some point and get used to being uncomfortable. Um, how, how, well, how would you sort of speak to that? And that's my personal opinion, obviously. You know, it's that same mentality when they do like studies where they're telling us things like, you know, why do a, a group of people watch someone getting attacked and nobody does anything? Because they all believe that somebody else is going to do something. Right. Somebody else is going to save that person. Somebody else is going to step in. So the problem with somebody else is that it's never you. Mm -hmm. So you're waiting on an action that you're capable of taking that you don't take. And I think it's really important for people to understand that no one is coming. No one is coming to save us. I mean, no matter 
whether you're an atheist or agnostic or you're religious, whatever you believe, I'm not speaking on your behalf, but if you are modeled on behalf of whatever you believe created you or the universe, or if it's just your own thinking, you have to understand that your ability to think and act is largely what determines the direction of your life. Nothing. So what really... if people are thinking and acting, or, or, or sorry, pardon me, let's go thinking, something's not right in Rome. We'll use the capital R, Rome is a global place in space. Mm -hmm. um, or, again, we do the dreaming, right? Mm -hmm. We perhaps ask questions. We, I, I mean, I, this is what I tell people, educate yourself, re read the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, you know, do your own independent investigations. Don't, you know, like all sources, including me, including anybody. Um, do you have any uh, specific, like what you'd like, or you would invite people to do as part of their daily uh, devotion to the future? Yeah, absolutely. I think there has to be a devotion to the future daily, whereby you are offering it blessings and you want it to be a friendly place. You want it to be a place where people begin to awaken. And I'm going to say this to everybody. At the beginning, when something happens, changes are made. And some people push back against them right away. Other people say, well, it's not that bad. Right. It's, it's, it's reasonable for what's going on. And then something else gets taken and then something else and then something else. So the question is for most people, how many dominoes need to fall? How much are you willing to give that you're not going to get back? At what point do rights become privileges? Those are two very important words. You know? I know I was, uh, I'm a fan of, uh, I'm, I don't know if you know of this gentleman, uh, Michael's, uh, is it Smilwood, um, Elders of the Borders. He mm -hmm. was a, a close friend of um, Grandfather Commanda's and he's sort of using, let, let's say, the, the history of your people and all First Nations peoples in Canada and around the world is like, mm, guys, watch what's happening, you know, watch what's happening and trying to sort of educate people. And he's a lawyer uh, by training. Um, does does your not your life because your life was different but your grandmother and your mother and would have all does anyone have a feeling of is this like similar like when I talk to a lot of my uh clients or friends or family who grew up in um Nazi Europe are are very very uh, worried um any anything similar like that trickling down in your community I would say so um equally divided some people are just critical thinkers and other people are just kind of trying to go with what they're being told because there's so much information. How do you sift through it? Where do you begin? Mm -hmm. And kind of probably afraid of being labeled as well. But I would say this to kind of everybody watching, it's very difficult probably for most of you to ever think that a government would take your children from you. This has happened. Mm -hmm. The last incidence of this happening in Canada for residential schools when it's in 1990 something it wasn't that long ago but you can't imagine that and the reason is you can't imagine that is probably because of the color of your skin it's probably because of your economic status and there's a belief that you are exempt and that exemption is dangerous because you do you think that the first people you know ever wanted to have their children taken from them the answer of course is no do you think they wanted to have any of the things happen to them that happened? No. You know, I remember people telling me stories of different agencies and organizations coming to do medical testing on them, drawing their blood, injecting them with things, never knowing what it actually was. So, you know, we live in a different world where for you that could never happen. Mm -hmm. So for everybody that it ends up happening to at some point, they always say the same thing. I never thought that would have happened. I thought that was a thing in our past uh, that only affected, you know, red people that only affected whatever. You never see it coming because a part of you can accept the fact is that a lot of us are just the frog in the beaker that's being heated up by your science teacher who's trying to explain to you that this frog is not capable of differentiating temperature changes. So it's not going to realize the water's getting hot because its body regulates that. The next thing you know, the frog is deceased. 
So hopefully they don't do that anymore in science classes. They, maybe they just use the example, but everybody is to the same point is that they do not have the consciousness. I'll give you a better example. You know, a movie that you and I watched, you know, uh, Jen, is they talked about the first people not being able to have the consciousness to understand what a huge sailboat was. <laughs> so therefore they couldn't literally perceive it. So next thing you know, these people are just on the shore and, um, you know, eventually, you know, the, the consciousness of one of the healers says, okay, there's something there, I can perceive it. He's trying to explain it to people who have no reference point. The only thing different this time is that sometimes other groups of people are the ones who can't see the boat this time. Yeah, or can't hear the music when we're dancing and they think we're crazy. We're like, yeah. So yeah. what happens with that? Because, you know, um, uh, my immediate family, thankfully, is um, uh, in alignment. Um, there are families being divided. So people dragging elders and go to, go get this, do, do that or else. Um, family members saying, if you don't do that, I can't see you. Like like you said, it's it's like this division which totally is ludicrous to me uh, anyway, on so many levels, but uh, I'm okay with that. Like, I, I think it's because I've lived a solitary life in some way or had a lot of bad things happen that, all right, me and the island of one, or, you know, me, myself and I, I'm okay with that. But I know it triggers a whole lot of people about belonging, tribe, uh, connection, family. Um, how, could we speak to that at all about- This was already- tested on aboriginal people the intentional destruction of the aboriginal family in canada residential schools of separating the healers from the tribe separating the children from the parents you know so when the then the elders and the premises that it was an intentional design to break the family so i see it quite clearly is that people you know, you can't come around unless you've had this, or if you've had this, you can't come around. And it's an, it's literally a break of the family again. It's just happening on a larger scale. So everything that gets rehashed, you know, has probably been tried somewhere with some degree of success. Right. And how would you, I mean, you're, you're good. I mean, I know you personally are good. Like, you know, it's, it's one, one thing if your immediate family is the nucleus, you have that support. It's when you're that lone wolf or the odd duck whatever, again, on both sides of the coin. So like both sides are doing this um, lesser our side, but certainly I've heard that sort of um, manipulation and, and dictate saying, if you don't do this, like, you know, um, how would you uh, help someone um, be okay with their decision? Like it, it, both sides have heart centered <laughs> uh, uh, polarization. Like they both feel as, as equally, you know, passionate about the issue. Um, so we just have to respect each other's position. You know what I mean? That's how I've tried to adopt it and recognizing there may be some losses along the way in my world, financial clients, friends, you know, family, um, access, access to certain things. Um, how would you help someone navigate that? I would tell them that, you know, from my point of view, I've seen what happens when people impose their will on other people. And I know the disaster that it creates. I mean, if you're being pressured to do anything, the odds are while you're being pressured is that you obviously have a different point of view or a different position, mm -hmm. but getting people around you, like family members or friends to pressure you into doing something is probably the most pressure you're going to be in. You know, you might be able to resist that from an outside source, but when it starts happening more closer to you, it's not just the breakup of families. It's also the breakup of community, which is the next step. So it starts at the nucleus and then it starts to radiate its way out. And so you begin to see these divisions and the more divided we are, the more polarized our outcomes become. So we're all on this planet together. We're all sharing this life together, whether or not we want it. And it's important to remember that everybody is positively intended. And I know that's difficult to understand no matter what side of the, um, what side of the aisle that you're on here for this particular issue but everybody really is doing what they feel is best. It doesn't mean that it is factually correct on either side. So when you, right. get, 
when you yeah, get- Yeah, so to me, the narrative, um, again, I, I use the word story narrative um, as someone who's trained in uh, media and marketing uh, and studied you know, oligarchies and governments around the world and their campaigns. I'm like, wow, this is a really good campaign strategy. Uh, we're all in this together is, is the, what the hashtag that I'm referencing. I'm like, yeah, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a mom with a healthy kid who's no longer healthy. You're not in this together. No, no one, no one is, you know, no, no one is here fighting my fight or helping me or my entrepreneur neighborhood or, you know, the small business owner or whatever, like whoever is affected in a negative way. Um, how do you address that? Like, again, I've always been um, someone who seeks collaboration and community and respects other people's opinions just don't cross a line on to my lawn, right? Like th this is my space. I have the right uh, to decide how to live or, or where to be. People say I don't have that right anymore because it affects them. And I'm like, hmm, I don't know. That That's a interesting argument. What, how would we spiritually talk about it? I mean, we have our personal opinions and then we have the higher, you know, the higher, the higher perspective. What I would say to anybody is, how would you feel about somebody tying you down, physically tying you down, and after that happens, they're able to do whatever they want to you? Would you be okay with that? Would you consent to that? And the odds are is that I'm guessing most people probably wouldn't like that, wouldn't want it, would never consent to it. So this is the fundamental thing for everybody. Your truth is not somebody else's truth. And you cannot judge somebody for the, the truth that they are choosing to be in. You may not agree with it, but that's where um, you know conversation takes place, where it might be, we're never going to agree on this, but I don't think it's worth um, the loss of our friendship or the loss of our family or the loss of our whatever. But when it comes that way, you know, some tribes come apart and, but they tend to come together to form new tribes on both sides. So, you know, you and I know it's happened already. Like th this is happening already. Um, the division of, like you say, families, friendships, tribes, um, churches, groups where there people could worship, like, um, and, you know, um, access to, uh, so far it's just international travel, but if we're going the way of Israel, um, it would be anything, food, shelter, you know, whatever, medical, who knows. Um, and again, to me, that's a problem for me. Other people want to go that way. That's great. Not, not the Canada that I was born into or want to live in. So again, what can we do uh, to respectfully dissent or say, hey, thanks, you know, not my party. Don't thanks. like the music playing right now. I mean, some of it is just basically um, it's contacting your member of parliament, contacting mm -hmm. your MPP in Canada. I mean, that does have value. It's not the only thing. But there's also the premise here is that when these things happen, there's always an opposing viewpoint, which means there's an opportunity, unfortunately. I mean, I wouldn't say unfortunately, but for other political parties, right? So their point of view is, okay, there's a, a growing movement here. Maybe we can get on board with this and we can start to side and make some key changes so maybe some people do the wrong thing or the right thing for the wrong reason but it still sometimes has value for us but i think the most important thing you do is that you can't forget who you are and if you believe yourself or identify yourself to be a spiritual person you're needed now more than ever and what you say matters what you think matters what you feel matters and the outcomes that you are creating, you know, we're supposed to be dreaming for seven generations that come after us. And this is coming from a planet, and I'm not saying for everyone exclusively, from a lot of people who live paycheck to paycheck, which is becoming increasingly harder now, um, you know, in the environment that we're living in. And so the idea of trying to envision for the next seven generations where we should be, you know, it's like, um, in terms of your vision, like you have to put your head up and not just look at the ground in front of you, just say, okay, there's a mountain and that mountain is seven generations away. So we have to get there. So what's the best route? So you've got to map out in your mind or is that the direction we want to go? And when we get there, what do we want? What do we need? 
So you're trying to live your life now and ensuring everybody who comes after you is able to do the same, to have that same right, that same privilege that you're doing. But we can lose ourselves very quickly in um, just trying to survive the moment because there's no proaction. So I would say that's the most important thing. There has to be proaction no matter where you are in your life. You know, 10% of your daily practice should be devoted towards proacting. And this is difficult for people who are always reacting to everything. Because the only thing that can happen is that you have to wait for another piece of information to come out. And it's like getting hit with a taser. Zap. I didn't like that. Zap. Zap. It keeps happening. So you've got to proact your way out of this and to say, okay, where is the, what is the healed outcome or what can it be? And can we do that enough to a point where, where we can make a change? So I'm going to give you a stat here. So this is usually used for technology. We talked about it in marketing. And it's the, um, the five customer segments of adopting something, yeah, yeah. Adopting a technology. So the innovators are the first 2.5%. So they're the first will, the ones willing to adopt a change. After that, there's the early adopters, second fastest category of individuals who adopt the innovation. Then there's the early majority, 34%. Late majority, 34%. Laggards and the 16%. <laughs> Laggard, that's a nice name. <clears throat> So if you think about that in the context of any idea, everybody in marketing and communication knows that. So an idea has been mapped out for technically seven generations. A message has been mapped out for seven generations. So at the beginning, whether you see yourself on either side of this aisle, there's a 2.5%, there's a 13.5%. Right. So they all exist. What that means for all of you in your life is that you've got 2.5% of the people who you began with who already believed what you believed. As it goes on longer, that 2.5% will be added by 13.5. And this is as people begin to surrender more and more of what they are. They're looking around going, the environment's changing. Um, I don't know what to do. But by the time everything is said and done, the laggards are the last ones to come to realization of a truth. And that's too late. Would you not agree? Correct. Right. So, so this is this is the concern I have is things are happening rapidly, especially with this news item that came out today. I was like, whoa. Uh, so there's a call to action for again, for this is not going to resonate for everybody. I understand it's uh, I'm probably in the minority, actually, frankly, in the in the big world wide world out there. And I'm OK with that. I'm kind of used to being in that place anyway. But how can we use the training, the tools to try to like, you know, like be Gandalf, thou shalt not pass, you know, like uh, stop the crazy and crazy making train. You have to acknowledge the emotions and thoughts that you have, <clears throat> or if you're an empath, the ones that you're feeling from people around you or in the world, and you've got to basically make gold out of it. You've got to literally philosopher's stone. You've got to transmute that. Harness, from, harness, harness. Yeah, you've got to harness it. You've got to transmute it into what you want. You've got to put it back out into the universe. So on that note, you and I had a sidebar conversation that was uh, initiated by uh, Lillian, Connie, Kathy, and Jane, who are on the panel. Um, you and I have agreed to hold space um, somewhere on some platform. I'm not sure if it's going to be Zoom or WhatsApp, um, whatever. For people who want to use the octaves, uh, harness, transmute, and for those of you who don't know, it's simple to, you know, just join the fun and we'll teach you how to do it, um, to sort of gather, gather the, you know, the energy and use it for something commonly productive. Um, I, what's interesting and sad to me about this whole issue, we all want the same thing if, apart from perhaps if you, depending on what theory you believe in, the small few, the majority want a happy, healthy society. Yeah, productive, uh, that kind of thing. So I always try to, uh, you know, within my own students, there's dissension. Um, not everyone agrees with me either, but we always work on commonalities. Like we're trying to create truth. We're trying to create equality, autonomy, uh, freedom, health, happiness, the luck. So um, can you speak to a bit about what you and I might, it might look like for people who want to join in the fun? And again, it doesn't really matter what you believe because you can use the tools, right? To create that higher truth, like the ultimate truth for the majority 
uh, not the 3% population in the world that, you know, runs things, but the rest of, of plebes like us. Um, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I think, you know, when you're trying to create a common goal, is that it doesn't have to be super specific, but mm -hmm. seeing everyone in a healthy way, seeing everyone being provided for, seeing people becoming aware of, um, you know, their role on the planet, their role in the universe, those are usually all good things that have to, that everyone benefits from. So I think that's really good. I think we should be able to, at a minimum, do that. So there's a lot of free energy out there. Um, you know, it's just currently mostly fear. And you've got to be able to just gather it up and to take it to the fire and to literally transmute it back into light. And mm. that's something that you can do. So I think a lot of, you know, spiritual people, religious leaders, you know, they believe in the power of prayer. It's not the only thing, but I'm just saying it does help in terms of mental health, emotional health, spiritual health. When you have a mechanism to, uh, to interact with those things so they don't overtake your life. We've seen so many people and mental health has gotten so much worse since all of these things have happened. It's not made the world a better place. You know, I get messages from clients who are telling me, you know, like a friend of theirs has taken their own life and, you know, they had been struggling and it just, it just got to a point where they couldn't cope there. The support wasn't there. So there's something that we can do about all of that, but we just can't buy into all of the fear that's being presented. I mean, that's not a good way to live. People are actually afraid of going outside. And, and this is what like the warrior in me, the public warrior in me is like, are you kidding me? Like the one thing that can give you the vitamin D, the, the fresh air, the perspective shift, people are afraid. And I'm like, oh, like how do you reach these people? And I'm bless them. Like, I suppose you could say pollution or whatever. Yeah, but it's almost like shocking to me and 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 uh i've literally cried many 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 tears about this it's 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 in my core that it's it's a sadness and that's i think you know a lot of empaths um are are feeling it uh especially when you're getting into the children and vulnerable populations um so we're going to do something right we're going to collectively band together the league of extraordinary evolving humans or whatever we are uh, and if anyone's interested, uh, just find me and um, I'll get you a link to the group. Uh, again, recognizing that some of us have different um, ideas of how to get there, of what needs to happen and how it happens. Uh, we acknowledge that, obviously. Uh, but I think we all can agree on happy, healthy society. Um, you know, and I just keep praying for the truth or envisioning the truth, uh, transparency, informed consent. Um, you know, coming out. Um, is there a way uh, that you may not have shared with people before uh, information or truth? Is there a special, um, not a ceremony necessarily, but if you get what I'm asking, like how do we ask for the truth to be revealed? Evidence. You know, I think that's part of awakening generally. Quickly. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's about allowing people to listen to their instincts on all sides of this and to speak and act their truth. Mm. That's, I think, the easiest way is that we're seeing shifts already and it's beginning to happen, but maybe not as fast as we would like, but is beginning to happen. So uh, you and I had spoken uh, about some really cool um, histories. Uh, I grew up in the mystery schools and the cosmic mythologies before training with you. And so I have another, and I'm sure you do too. Um, what's really neat, um, uh, Wendy Kennedy, who is a channeler of the Palladians called the Peas, uh, I believe it's higherfrequency.net, her website. Uh, so let me just say it's channeled information. So I can't vet it out. I can't create evidence. Like I, I you know, you resonate or don't. Uh, she would tell the story of the Orion Wars. Uh, so the planet Orion, was a slave state for many, many thousands of years. And um, they were spiritually evolved, like sort of in a technical way, um, very much minority report. Remember the Tom Cruise movie where they could track someone's intent and get the crime uh, before it was about to happen? Like not even like 
it was the technology, the AI. So the Orion Wars happened, uh, or the slave state happened, um, the oligarchy controlled people by reading their minds. And so for those people who wanted to dissent or find a way through, um, had to go so deep, deep, deep into their consciousness, they had to hide their prayers, their ceremonies, their thoughts deep within them. And it took uh, a while in order for their consciousness to change uh, as a planet. Uh, but it is a success story. Um, and what the stories go about Orion is it's so it was so much worse than even the Holocaust um, than like some of the worst atrocities on Earth. They had to really go within in order to block this sort of AI stuff. Um, it's shared um, to give people a sense of the power of who they are, right? That we're all stardust. We're 93 percent made of stardust, that we're the Adam Camdons. We come from the stars. Um, and on that point, you're in your tradition, as you well know, uh, you, you uh, acknowledge the star nations, right? The star brothers. Well, in the mystery school tradition, uh, the Aboriginal people were invited from another galaxy into our earth plane because we weren't learning. We weren't growing or evolving. We weren't getting it. And um, the invitation was accepted with a contract, a fixed period of time. Uh, that the Aboriginal peoples of the world, so all, all countries, all traditions, uh, were, came here to help, you know, the planet Earth's original mission. Um, and you had mentioned something, remember, do you remember this, where the contract was fulfilled? Do you remember the timing of a contract being fulfilled and you said, yeah, we don't have to be here anymore? I don't mean that you guys would actually get on a spaceship and take off, but that the, let's say, cosmic contract was up. Do you remember that? Yeah, it was for um, five great years. So basically, you say 23,000 year cycle. And so five of those have been fulfilled. Yeah, so can you speak more to that? Because again, I have my knowledge and your training. Other people may not. Can you kind of give a bit, bit of background to the story? Fill in the holes? As the story goes, it's just... Um, let me tell it as a fiction story. Yes, of course. All right. So here's a, a fiction, a fictional story. A long time ago, um, there were different warring factions who moved throughout the universe. And some people were trying to flee the conflict on different sides. And um, say hypothetically, one day they arrived on a planet. And on this planet, they found a group of people who, from their point of view, were very basic. They didn't have technology. They didn't have anything. They lived a very tribal type lifestyle. And, uh, you know, one day one of them arrives there. You might have called them a refugee ship, heavily damaged. And um, they ask, they're looking for something to help their people. Um, literally, they're looking for food. They're looking for water. Those are easy things to find there. But the ship's damaged. Their leader is damaged, you know, and they don't know what to do. And so one of the um, one of these basic people basically lay their hands on this seemingly advanced civilization and end up healing them, completely healing the body, and then end up touching the, the vessel that brought them there, and it heals. Even though it's not organic, it mm. heals. And so these people are trying to run away, saying, we have to leave here because these are people that are following us will come here and they will decimate you and um, whatever. And she just says, talking in their minds, don't worry, I'll talk with them when they get here. Sure enough, the next group arrives, they try to initiate a conflict, their ship doesn't work. It lands comfortably and two more come after that. So in all of these things, um, she's trying to talk with them to talk to them about conflict where it leads and the cost of being right and this group really struggled with the concept of spirituality they didn't really understand it it's an alien concept they don't get it and so in the story this fictional story she has to regress them back to an earlier version of themselves where they don't have all of the advanced uh, Acumon, you might say, of, of living, where they have to focus on the basics. So the basics for any um, sentient life form 
is the ability to forgive, the ability to have compassion, and the ability to have love for themselves and for other people. When you have these things and you have technology, life can be pretty sweet. When you have technology and not those things, it's going to get really bloody really quickly. So in the telling of this fictional story, um, they are sent to a place where they have to learn how to coexist. And a group is sent with them to help oversee them. And the rule is that they cannot interfere with them. And they themselves are not allowed to use their abilities to influence either way. So what they can teach them is to come into right relationship with their environment and their land and hopefully themselves should they choose to accept that. And so that's the fictional story that brings us to where we are. We are living, um, you know, in that parable or in that, um, that version of the story where we are now is that every civilization on this planet that has had advanced technology has ended their civilization. Rome did. Rome fell because of corruption. You know, the Mayans, gone. The Egyptians, you know, back in the day, pyramids, gone. So it's not a story that's original. It's a story that for most people at the height of their technology, they do not have the the virtues to be able to work with it, to say we should maybe we shouldn't create a weapon of mass destruction, maybe we shouldn't use that, maybe that's not a good idea. And the weapon in, in our story may not be a missile. Correct. Yeah. So, um, the premise, so the premise is what is what is it that ends these civilizations? What happens to those people? How can something so grandiose be retaken by the jungle or be retaken by sand to the point where nobody would even remember that it was there? What is left behind? So those people who are descended of, even they can forget the story of where they came from and how it was. So in the fictional story that I've told, it's how does a group of people, how do they remember who they are and what's important to them? And how do they learn to have forgiveness and compassion and love towards themselves and other people when all of the environment might be saying, well, that's not what we should do. Uh, going back to your comment about the five years, which I'm assuming you're talking about a cosmic year, which is 26,000 years, or is it what, what do you uh, go back to this co comment about time for a second? You said you have, it was a five year contract, which translates to Earth time, what? I'd say approximately 23,000 year, 23, years per great year. Yeah, I, I heard 26, but I'll, I, I mean, I'm not going to debate that. So long time, <laughs> long time for every year. And how many years left? None. Oh, we're up. Mm -hmm. Time's up. Okay. So in the telling of that story, that's how it went. And we evolve. Unfortunately, when our backs are to the wall, but most species do. So it's not just us. So when we are pushed far enough, when we're brought to the brink of something, we have the ability to come together in a really beautiful way. What we're trying to do is not be so reactionary about that. How can we work together before it has to get that bad. So what would you say, so I hear you and I don't disagree with you, obviously. Um, again, I just want all of us to live peacefully, but let me live peacefully. Like, let me live my way peacefully. Um, my child is in a school. I shop at a grocery store. I'm not home farmed. I'm not off the grid. Uh, I need the government for certain things like we all do uh, if we're you know, in a society or a city. Um, how do we maintain our autonomy when the rules are coming down that may be limiting our choice? Like, do I have to, and I'm being facetious, but there's a lot of people getting out of Dodge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for anybody, you've got to really figure out what your values are <clears throat> and what you're not willing to surrender regardless. <clears throat> you know, if somebody showed up at my home and said, we're going to take your children or do something to your children that's what they're going to propose I have a different proposal and those two proposals are not compatible so you've got to be able to have lines of what is your hard no you have to know what your hard no is and you've got to be able to stick to that anything after that 
when you've compromised yourself enough, you're not going to be you. So the life that you have is not going to be what you think. What makes you you is your ability to express yourself the way that you want to, to be you, to have you know, the reasonable freedoms to go where you want to go and do what you want to do. And that's not unreasonable. And when you start creating two classes of people, and I can tell you being native, you know, we are part of that class. We already, we already were, mm -hmm. <clears throat> is that you can't get out from under it quickly. The stigmas and all of the things that are going to stick with you are not going to be, you don't come back from it in that way, not, not quickly. Yeah, there's a uh, instance when um, one of the small, I, I'll say Caribbean, because I, I don't know um, if I'm in the right ocean or right area, but a Caribbean island was under the threat of a volcano recently, about a month ago, not Nevis or something like that. Anyway, um, the large uh, cruise ship line sent in help um, to take, take people off the island. The president of that little country said only people certain people could go the others had to stay back and it was the first real evidence of like this division like from a from a political leader when there was a real life uh you know the the, the, the lava was flowing and people were were in need um interesting that the the companies that sent the boats did not have that mandate did not make that qualification uh, a part of their rescue but the president of the country or the prime minister of that country did. Um, that really scared me as a poli sci background person. Like I was like, wow, okay. So, you know, uh, how, um, when you're triggered that way, or again, when your heart is feeling, again, both sides have it, both sides have heart, both sides have their positions. Um, and funny enough, both sides have real good science um, to look at. And so that's where I, I just don't understand where we all have to be all or nothing. Like it's just one way to roam. Um, it's the sadness and the grief and the anger that's, I think, um, destabilizing those of us maybe who can serve or do something about it. Again, you would just invite, let me just recap your words. We heal it, right? We heal it inside of us. Correct. I yeah. get triggered my issue. And then what you need to see, what can you reasonably do on the outside of you that can help? Yeah. So yeah, you don't want it to take root inside of you. You don't want it to, for some people, if they can't be who they are, they'd rather be dead. Mm -hmm. That's the reality is that I don't want to be somebody who I'm not. I don't want someone to tell me who I am or who I need to be. I mean, being native, that's, we've been told that our whole lives. So it doesn't play well. It just doesn't play well. So I've also said, you know, when you're at the beginning of something, you never see it for what it is because it's too, it's too much to take in. Mm -hmm. It changes too much of your reality to say that we look back at history and we say, well, how could people not have seen this coming? All of the indicators were there. And the reason why they couldn't is because they could is that they did not want to. Mm -hmm. It was too much to bear. Yeah. And the belief is, is that, this, as I said, it, this could never happen to us. It could never happen to me. This is something that happens to other people or people who are parts of other groups or different parts of the world that can happen, but it could never happen here. Well, like, as you said, it, it has in the First Nations, the J Japanese, the internments, um, all, like, like all, all kinds of peoples. Uh, Canada has definitely not been... Um, uh, a stellar, you know, and I, I think maybe it's the white privilege, the European background, like, or the people that just haven't had it affect them, right? That's over there. That's not me. That's too bad. I don't agree with it, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Now it's happening to everybody, right? Every color, every body is having to, um, in my opinion, like, uh, take a position, right? You and I would call it hold the line, hold the light. Uh, what does hold the line mean to you? It means don't give up your spiritual practice of the thing that creates peace for you or is a part of your day. It is to continue to meditate, continue to pray. But your prayer should become an emotion of how you want to feel and how you want to feel in this world, not 
anything that's fear-based or anxiety-based. That's the most important thing. If you can clear up your signal, what you're putting out into the conscious contribution has a tremendous amount of weight. Because even fear signals are not that coherent. That's what we have going for us. There's just a lot of them and they're intense, but they're not necessarily coherent. So things that are coherent tend to be heard better. Mm -hmm. And what is your position? And if it's, if you'd rather not answer, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. Um, you know, I, uh, sometimes I forget there are other people watching our conversation. So I always have to kind of check myself. Um, recently I've been shocked as a, as a spiritual teacher, uh, with some small public, uh, influence on a local level anyway, um, seeing, uh, international public figures, spiritual public figures saying, do this, like, this is the way this is. And I'm like, you shouldn't be saying that at all. In my opinion, like that, that, that's a first indication there's a problem in the world. Um, what did you, how did you feel when, uh, I don't want to name any, uh, bodies or groups, but. I think the nature of some religions is that that is what they do because that's the nature of religion. It's like, this is what you have to do. This is what we're doing. And if you're part of this, you need to do it too. Right. Fear of being left out. Yeah. yeah. But as it gets into more of the spiritual realm, if we make a differentiation between spirituality and religion, which I will attempt to do, religion is where somebody interprets for you, mm -hmm. the text or the scripture or whatever yeah. it is, and they interpret for you. In spirituality, your relationship is directly with creator, whatever that is to you. So there's not necessarily a middleman. So you do your yeah. own interpretation. So in spirituality, it's very difficult to tell people what to do or that they need to do this is almost counter message. Yeah. It's counter message and it creates a, a wobble. Let's call it a wobble in the time space continuum of spirituality. Yeah. So that's what happened to me is like the religious ones. I, I, the one I was like, yeah, okay. That's part of them, but the spiritual leader that's sort of a religious one, but doesn't acknowledge their, their practices religious when he came out and I was like, Oh boy. And then a recent Canadian, uh, very famous author basically said to people do this or you're not spiritual. And I'm like, Whoa, big, like I unfollowed, I deleted. I'm like, yeah, no dude. Like you've missed the role you're playing in the world because it's all about everyone has to think and choose for themselves, right? Like that's, that's. Yeah, I'm not, I've never been comfortable telling people what to do, mm -hmm. like what to eat, what not to eat, whether or not to have alcohol. It's not my business. So I'm really comfortable staying in my lane and to tell somebody that they're not spiritual is, just doesn't sit well. Cause I think everyone's spiritual. Just yeah. They express it differently and using negative emotions to create change is not sustainable it doesn't lead to a good place right that so now fear fear, fear hunters fear. you you trained us to be the fear hunters uh, again even if for those of you who are not uh studied with uh, pete or any of his students like myself um we're going to perhaps offer an opportunity um uh out, off this outside of this one um disco discourse for those of you who want to go chase some fear, eat it up and send it back out as positivity in the world. And frankly, I don't know anybody who can't hold that. Um, even if you disagree on how we get there or what needs to happen. So um, find me, uh, jenniferclark.ca, or I, I think I'm the host of this. So uh, you can have my email there. Let me know. I believe I'll need your emails uh, or yeah, I'll, I'll need your emails to send out a, like a, a Zoom link or a WhatsApp invite. Not sure how Pete and I are going to do it. And um, I also have another group that's a little more, uh, a little more, I'll just say a little more uh, that has a little more alignment with a certain philosophy. If you're interested in that one, um, there is a group going, trying to you know advocate how we can uh, make change happen in the geopolitical world, um, using you know peaceful, positive, but action-oriented uh, strategies. Because again, um, people are being called up, um, as Pete and I have discussed, and many of you have posted. Some of you, you know, it's time to wake up the lions, the sleeping lions, or you know. Um, 
get the sheep with the horns like you know like who do we need to recruit i'm kidding but uh for those of you who want to do something there are things that you can do and we hope pete and i that um this discourse has helped you in some way uh, many of you I, I know most of you online thank you uh you well know this you you've been down the rabbit hole uh, enough and long enough um to know um one of the things i think both pete and i want you guys to realize is you're not alone and that despite whatever side you're on, the general population wants the same goal. You know, wants a healthy, happy society where children are laughing and playing without masks, where, you know, we're traveling, we're dancing um, to our favorite rock bands and music festivals and, you know, at churches and mosques and prayers and just being out to circulate. Um, any last thoughts for you, Pete? Um, people can find um, more about Pete's programs, which I highly recommend uh, at the8fire.com. Um, anything, any last comment, Pete, before we sign off today? Yeah, you have uh, a say and a right in your own life. So you have these rights to assert them. Nobody can, you know, as it relates to your body, nobody can tell you what to do. So yeah, we fought and for that right. Women have fought for that right. And, you know, I don't think it's a good one to surrender. Yeah, I agree. I'm with you. Uh, and uh, my light warrior training, the new cohort starts in June. Um, it's a 10 week program giving you some energy tools on how to be in the world with more energy protection and mindfulness and uh, awareness of purpose and power. You can go to lightwarriortraining.com to learn more. All right, guys, thanks for joining us today. We hope you have a great day. Remember, take time to be kind and remember you are the change we're waiting for. Much love everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Bye-bye.